evening. I'm not even sure I need this, but I'll use it anyway, just for sake of form. Can you hear me at the back? Good, okay. Well, thank you for coming. We're very glad to see you. My name is Barbara Altman. I'm the director of the Oregon Humanities Center, which is a research center at the University of Oregon. So this is a field trip for us. We bring um, one or two or three of our speakers up to the White Stag Building um, every year, and we're really pleased to be closing our yearly series on the, the year of the book with this lecture here in Portland. I'm honored to introduce this evening Kwame Anthony Appia, Lawrence S. Rockefeller University Professor of Philosophy at Princeton University, and he is our 2009-2010 Tzedek Professor in the Humanities. We've given him a busy schedule. Yesterday in Eugene, he taped an interview with me for our TV show UO Today, and then held a seminar for m students and faculty, mostly in philosophy. And then he gave a lecture last night entitled Defending Freedom of Expression in the Written Word to, to bring home our theme of Year of the Book. As you know, the title of tonight's lecture here in Portland is A Life of Honor. Appiah is first and foremost a philosopher whose interests include moral, social, and political philosophy, as well as African and African American studies. After an early book on assertion and conditionals and other work on semantics, he has turned to issues more related to personal and political identity, multiculturalism, and nationalism. Apia has authored numerous scholarly works, a great many articles, three novels, and he has edited 19 other volumes. Titles you might be familiar with are In My Father's House, Africa in the Philosophy of Culture, 1992, The Ethics of Identity from 2006, and Experiments in Ethics, 2008. His highly acclaimed book from 2006, Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers, has been translated already in these three and a half years into 15 languages, including Portuguese, both Brazilian and uh, Iberian, Chinese, Dutch, Greek, Hebrew, Indonesian, Korean, Romanian, and Turkish. I take that as proof of the broad, deep interest in the notion of cosmopolitanism, which argues, to put it in a very reductionist and brief way, that individuals should seek an identity as a citizen of the world in order to be responsive to the needs of others, but do so without denying their own heritage or community. His newest book, from which tonight's work is drawn, I believe, will be out very shortly, and is titled The Honor Code, How Moral Revolutions Happen. Both cosmopolitanism and the honor code have garnered great praise as brilliant work. Brilliant is the adjective that comes up more often than any other. And I quote, an indispensable book for both moral philosophers and honorable citizens. Those are the words of Walter Isaacson in a review of the Honor Code. With that kind of a profile, Professor Oppi is the perfect fit for our annual Tzedek professorship in the humanities. The endowment for this yearly lectureship was established in 1996 with a very generous gift from steadfast donors to the center who allow us to do much of what we do. The title is a reference to the Hebrew word for righteousness or justice. And the professorship is intended to bring someone who is both a scholar and a practitioner, a thinker and a doer, someone who makes personal ethical responsibility to others the focus of his or her, her work. We invited Professor Appia to be this year's TEDx lecturer because in addition to his published work on personal responsibility, he is also the president since last year of the Penn American Center. In case you want a little more detail on what the Pan American Center is, I quote from their website, it is the US branch of the world's oldest international literary and human rights organization. International Pen was founded in 1921 in direct response to the ethnic and national divisions that contributed to the First World War. Pan American Center was founded in 1922 and is the largest of the 144 Pen centers in 101 countries that together compose International Pen. Pen American Center comprises 3,400 professional members who represent the most distinguished writers, translators, and editors in the United States. Throughout its 85-year history, Pen American Center has remained a writer-centered organization in which members play a leading role. 
Appy has spent more than a decade involved with Penn as a member, and since last year, he's now the latest in a long line of very well-known and high-profile Penn presidents. Some of those who preceded him are Arthur Miller, Norman Mailer, Susan Sontag, and Salman Rushdie, all of whom have continued to push ahead with a struggle to oppose censorship and defend writers across the world. It was especially on the basis of that work with Penn that we asked Professor Appiah to be the concluding series in our Year of the Book um, programming for this year. It was a series that included discussion of new technologies in book production, the challenge for libraries and archives in the age of digitization, issues of access to knowledge through documents, knowledge as power, and the historical, artistic, and literary concerns associated with the book as an artifact. We wanted to bring home this diverse, wild and woolly, wonderful series with a consideration on freedom of written expression, and that was what Professor Appiah addressed in Eugene last night. Let me take a moment for one piece of business. You will find on your chairs, you may be sitting on them, a small white piece of paper. We would be very grateful to you if you could help us by filling out where you heard about this talk. We're always trying to refine our publicity in Portland, and we've tried a couple of new things this time, so if you would be good enough to let us know how you heard about the event, that would be very helpful. And we have some incentive for you, in fact. We have a signed copy of Apia's book, Cosmopolitanism, which we will raffle off after the talk and just before the Q&A. So in case you needed a little to find the stub of a pencil in the bottom of your pants pocket, or if we can lend you one, please fill that out if you would, and we'll collect them at the end of the lecture. Perhaps we'll ask Professor Appiah if he would do the drawing so that you know that <laughs> it was by an impartial, an impartial judge. I would also like to announce that Professor Appiah will be speaking at Oregon State University tomorrow. So he's doing a, a sweep of the three big sites in Oregon. He will be speaking on race and the new genomics tomorrow, Friday evening from 6 to 7.30 in the LaSalle's Stewart Center at the OSU uh, campus with a reception to follow. So I feel as though we already are a group of groupies following him up and down I-5. <laughs> if you'd like to join us all in Corvallis tomorrow night, please do. If you like this particular event and want to follow what the Oregon Humanities Center is doing, we invite you to add your, naming, your name to our mailing list, which is on uh, the table just outside the doors. And please feel free to check out our website, which you can reach from the University of Oregon homepage for a calendar of our events. Next year, our uh, theme is sustenance, and we will be bringing as one of our first guests, Terry Tempest Williams, who's coming to Eugene at the beginning of November. One last thing before handing over to our speaker for the evening. I'd be remiss if I didn't say a few more thank yous. It's been a long year full of wonderful events. It's been very busy and gratifying. My job as director is to put a public face on the center and our events, but the really hard work is done by the others on the staff. So my thanks to everyone there in our, in our busy office, to Peg Gearhart, who designs our striking publicity, to Melissa Gustafson and her, her wonderful faithful spouse who comes and helps us every time, Chris, and she handles all the event planning, to Lindsay Hendrickson, who's also here helping us run this tonight and fields everything that happens in the front office, and whose fiance is with her to help us tonight as well. <laughs> and especially thanks to Julia Hayden, our associate director, who is the center of everything we accomplish. Without any further ado, please help me welcome Kwame Anthony Apia. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> thanks for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you this evening. Uh, to uh, talk about honor, and um, so I should begin by saying how honored I am at your invitation, and how honored I am that I've been invited as a tzedek since, uh, since um, I'm very conscious of uh, how much less righteous I am than I could be. But uh, thanks very much for the invitation. So. Uh, uh, as, as was mentioned, I've, I've uh, recently uh, done some work on honor. I finished a book on honor, which will be out in the fall. So what I thought I would do today is talk, uh, to begin with, about three sort of schematic case histories of the role of honor in a number of important 
moment of moral change. And I want to do this because I, I think it's important to understand how honor works in particular times and places if you want to make sense of it. And then at the same time to recognize that despite the diversity of the manifestations, there is in fact a pattern of attitude and behavior across these diverse cases. And uh, once I've said something about that, I want to try and identify some lessons about honor in our own time. So, but to begin with, as I say, um, here are three somewhat schematic case studies. If I were a historian, I would spend the whole time on one of them. Uh, uh, and in my book, I've spent a great deal of time on each of them. But uh, let me just talk about three interesting cases from which I hope we can draw some conclusions. Um, the first has to do with the modern European duel, uh, which developed at the end of the Middle Ages and grew out of a practice called the judicial duel, in which a, a dispute between two men of sufficient standing, uh, you had to be of the rank of a squire or above, uh, could be settled by a prince who would, as the expression was, give them the field. So the prince would witness the event, and the survivor of the combat was deemed to have won the legal case. The modern duel, which replaces this, enters the life of the English aristocracy, and that's where I'm going to follow it, uh, in the 16th century. But it was governed by codes that originate, like much of English elite culture in the Renaissance, in Italy. Now, now the right to combat over affairs of honor was claimed as a privilege of the nobility, and there was no longer any uh, re uh, re demand that there should be a prince who gave you permission to fight. The judicial duel had been anathematized by the church as early as the ninth century. And at the Council of Trent in 1563, at the end of the Reformation, uh, the Roman Catholic Church took trouble to condemn, and I'm quoting, this is the official Vatican translation of the Latin, the detestable custom of dueling introduced by the contrivance of the devil, that by the bloody death of the body, he may accomplish the ruin of the soul. So the modern duel inherited these religious objections to the judicial duel, because to engage in dueling was to place honor above Christian duty. And in fact, in the Council of Trent, uh, anyone who gives permission to someone else to, uh, to engage in a duel uh, is excommunicated automatically. Nobody has to do anything. You're self it's a self-excommunicating act. It's a very serious offense against canon law. This was not a topic that divided Catholics from Protestants. As the great uh, evangelical campaigner William Wil Bilberforce observed in 1797, the duel's essential guilt consists in this, that it is a deliberate preference of the favor of man before the favor and approbation of God, wherein we run the risk of rushing into the presence of our maker in the very act of offending him. <laughs> Once the duel had passed from judicial combat, which could take place only with the king's permission, or the sufficiently important prince's permission, to a private and illegal act claimed as a privilege of the nobility, it faced a further problem. It was what was called les majesté. It was a challenge to the authority of the prince, or, or the crown. And from the point of view of the modern state, which was developing uh, its great strength precisely in this period when we see the rise of the duel, the problem is that unlike judicial combat, the modern duel uh, fails to acknowledge the king's supremacy. And as uh, Francis Bacon once put it nicely, it was therefore an offense of presumption. Francis Bacon argued that the, um, uh, the duel assumes that the law of reputation should supersede both canon law and civil law, and that, this is a quote, the statute books must give place to some French and Italian pamphlets. Uh, he's referring to the duello codes, which came from Italy and defined how you should conduct the duel. Among the great enemies of the duel, therefore, are men like Bacon. He was Attorney General of England when he wrote that and his younger French contemporary, Cardinal Richelieu, who were engaged in extending the power of the state in part by subordinating the nobility with its independent claim to honor to the increasingly all-embracing reach, reach of the crown. So as the aristocracy lost much real power to the center in the, 16, in the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, it insisted all the more fervently on this one symbol of its autonomy. So the duel was unchristian, immoral, and illegal. It was also, as Enlightenment critics pointed out, irrational. The rational problem at bottom about a duel is that it's about an offense by A against B's honor, but its outcome 
depends in no way on whether A or B is in the wrong. So the first lesson of the duel is that codes of honor can run against religion, against law, against morality, and against reason, and survive nevertheless. A second is that honor can survive not only an abstract set of objections from these other sources of norms, but it can survive the onslaughts of church and state uh, and ignore uh, what is right and reasonable. So when Voltaire remarked in an aside in the Philosophical Dictionary that dueling is, quote, forbidden by reason, by religion, and by all the laws, he was reporting an intellectual consensus. Um, and uh, often what Voltaire said was disagreed with by other people, but in that case he was saying something that everybody would have agreed to be true. So, nevertheless, despite these well-known objections, the duel was a practice of English gentlemen as it was in Europe more generally. The codes, the duello codes, set what should prompt a duel, who should engage in it, and how it should be conducted. The duel's honor world consisted of gentlemen and ladies everywhere, not merely in England. You could duel with somebody from another society. And in creating a class of honor peers, gentlemen, who were required to respond to a proper challenge by agreeing to a duel, it created a potentially global network of people who were governed by the code. A challenge from someone who was not a gentleman could be ignored. At the beginning of the 19th century, there'd been an increase in the frequency of dueling, in part because the turn of the 19th century was an extended period of warfare. This is the period of the Napoleonic Wars. Some half a million Britons had served in the Anglo-French warfare between the execution of Louis, uh, Louis XVI in 1793 uh, and the Battle of Waterloo. These officers brought back from Europe a military culture of honor. And yet, by the mid-19th century, the duel had completely ceased to be part of the repertory of the English gentleman. So what brought about this moral revolution? Well, one powerful suggestion made in the work of V.G. Kiernan, the preeminent historian of the European duel, is that the class whose norm it was, the nobility, was gradually losing its central place in British life. The ruling aristocracy was being replaced in the 19th century by a new class, men whose family fortunes had been made in what the aristocrats disparaged as trade. New state bureaucracies were developing, run by a growing and increasingly professionalized class of officials. Well, businessmen believe in being businesslike, and bureaucrats famously like things orderly too. So many in these new classes believed in parliamentary reform. They wanted to deny the landed aristocracy their traditional rights to allocate seats in the House of Commons, they wanted to stop vote buying and to extend the franchise to uh, least to middle class and eventually to working class people. So dueling was yet another of the pretensions of the old aristocracy, and these new people wished to see it brought to an end. That, along with the increasing spread of Protestant evangelical movement, which saw the duel as ungodly and focused on that fact, it had been ungodly all along, but the evangelicals started taking seriously the question of what was ungodly, these were enough to motivate large parts of the political class against the duel. And William Wilberforce, whom I mentioned, who is more famous as an opponent of, of the slave trade, was also a very big figure in the campaign against dueling. Perhaps nothing displays the changing meaning of the word gentleman more sharply than the fact that the English Catholic Cardinal Newman could say in 1852, at about the time the duel ceases entirely, quote, it is almost a definition of a gentleman to say that he is one who never inflicts pain. Well, if that's what a gentleman is, nothing could be more ungentlemanly than a duel. After all, duels are about inflicting pain. So after three centuries, the ethos of a Christian bourgeoisie triumphed over an old warrior nobility. Sir so Francis Bacon anticipated a second reason why the duel came to an end when the modern duel was just beginning. He published his Charge Touching Duels, which I already cited, in 1614. The charge included part of the argument for the prosecution in a case that he, as the new Attorney General, had brought before the Court of Star Chamber. The publication, like the case, was part of a campaign against dueling, which had become distressingly common around the court of James I. This outburst of what um, uh, Bacon calls private quarrels among great men led the king to issue an ordinance against dueling. 
Bacon told the judges that he was addressing, I should think, my lords, that men of birth and quality will leave the practice when it begins to come so low as to barbers, surgeons, and butchers, and such base mechanical persons. So towards the beginning of the modern duel, Bacon here anticipated the outcome. A duel was an affair of honor. It depended on the existence of a powerful class who could establish their status by engaging in a practice contrary to law that was limited to them. So its illegality was an important part of its, uh, c uh, the reason why it could be used to sustain their honor. It was a further sign of the diminishing status of that nobility that in the first decades of the 19th century, duels began to take place more frequently between people who, if they were gentlemen at all, were so by virtue of their membership in the professions or of their success in trade. So that once base mechanical persons could contemplate engaging in duels, the duel's capacity to distinguish between uh, and to bring distinction was exhausted. Bacon's is the view looking forward as the duel is beginning its rise towards its 18th century highest point. For a backwards view, listen to Richard Cobden, the great liberal parliamentarian, in a speech in 1859, recalling when dueling was, as he said, a regular mode of meeting a certain description of insult. Cobden says, well, I, he's speaking to the electorate in a, he's, this is an election campaign speech. Well, I remember that some linen draper's assistants took it into their heads to go down one Sunday morning and they began fighting duels. And then as soon as the linen draper's assistants took to dueling, it became very infamous in the eyes of the other classes. Now, nothing would be so ridiculous as any nobleman or gentleman thinking of resenting an insult by going out and fighting a duel about it. End of Cobden. So Cobden's view was that Bacon's prediction had been confirmed. However belatedly, Bacon's prediction had been several hundred years earlier, the adoption of dueling by base men had led to its relinquishment by the aristocracy. And his mocking tone reminds us that in an increasingly democratic age, the duel was an unloved symbol of aristocratic privilege. Perhaps the last time one gentleman shot another on the field of honor in England was in 1852, when the two members of parliament for Canterbury, some constituencies in Britain had two members of parliament, for complicated historical reasons, uh, the two members of parliament for Canterbury met over an election dispute in what is often said to be the last duel in England. It was, Keenan writes, an appropriately burlesque event with the two men and their seconds having to share the station fly at Weybridge. So they had to share the taxi to the uh, place where they were, because there, there was only one taxi. As one contemporary observed, the incident was dealt with in a witty article in the London Times. And so, and this is the important thing, ridicule at last did more than morality to kill dueling. Salvunto risu tabulae, the, uh, this author says, and he's translating, he's quoting a line from Horace's satires, which means the case is dismissed with laughter. What better tool than mockery to turn against honor, whose aim is precisely to be worthy of respect? There's a very different moral revolution involving honor, which occurred at the uh, turn of the 20th century with the abandonment of foot binding by the Chinese literate elite. Here, as with dueling, we have a practice that was understood to be problematic long before it came to an end. Foot binding probably began sometime around the turn of the first millennium, 900-something. Um, uh, as a result, it didn't have the most profound support that a practice could have among the mandarins because it was unknown to Confucius. Confucius had been dead for a couple of thousand years. Furthermore, the Manchus, who overthrew the Ming dynasty in 1644 and established the last of the imperial dynasties, were actually opposed to foot binding, and they tried from time to time, somewhat half-heartedly, to eradicate it. Everyone understood not only that foot binding could limit the movement of women and help them keep them subject to their families and to men, but also that it was extremely painful. Almost as soon as it began, there were literati who opposed it. Within a couple of centuries of the beginning, a Song Dynasty literatus wrote, children not yet four or five years old, innocent and without crime, are caused to suffer limitless pain. And there's a traditional Chinese perver proverb that says, one pair of tiny feet, but two wells full of tears. So as with dueling, what brought foot binding to an end cannot have been the discovery of moral arguments against it, because the arguments were well known from the earliest days of the practice. 
So to understand the end of bookbinding, you need to enter the world of the Chinese literati at the end of the 19th century as they tried to understand what was happening to their country. For half a century since the opening of wars of the early 1840s, they had seen their armies defeated time and again on their own soil by foreigners from the West and from Japan, and then been subjected to humiliating treaties that forced them to accept the presence in China of large numbers of Christian missionaries. These missions began the first campaigns against footbinding, organizing the first anti-footbinding associations in China, and they were followed by organizations led by the wives of the business, uh, Western business elite on the, on the coast. But soon uh, they began to, these uh, anti-footbinding organizations, to be arranged by members of the Chinese, the Han literati, like a certain Kang Yuwei, who saw some degree of westernization as necessary if China was to find its place in the modern world. The focus of the literati was on the good of China. If ending footbinding was good for women, so much the better, no doubt. But their writings have a kind of nationalist flavor. Some of their arguments were instrumental. They insisted, for example, that the havoc wrought in military campaigns and invasions from abroad was made worse by the fact that so many women were literally unable to run away. And they argued that the physical vigor of women who could engage in sports because their feet were free would make them mothers of healthier children. But they also insisted very often that foot binding needed to end because it was a source of national shame. In an appeal to the throne against foot binding in the 1890s, Kang Yu Wei, who I just mentioned, made this central to his argument. Indeed, his memorial, that's what memorandums to the throne were conventionally called, as Virginia Chow summarizes it, starts with the claim that it is, quote, a shame for China to have such a barbarous custom which makes it a laughingstock in the eyes of foreigners, and ends with these words. Speaking of the law of the country, it is a most unjustifiable penalty. Speaking of the maintenance of harmony in the family, it harms the love of parents for their children. Speaking of the strengthening of the army, it leaves generation after generation of weak descendants. And finally, speaking of beauty and customs, it becomes a subject of ridicule to foreigners. It is therefore intolerable. So Kang begins and ends with the nation's honor, or rather with the loss of honor through shame. His protege, Lang Chi Chao, another of the leading Chinese intellectuals of the early 20th century, wrote in 1896, quote, it seems that this ridiculous custom has flourished generation after generation against imperial prohibition and become the laughing stock of foreigners. So the concern for the nation's honor persisted well into the 20th century, long after the practice had gone into serious decline. One writer in the 1930s asked if it was not better to allow the practice to die out gradually with the poor following the example of the rich, as they had as the practice was originally established. Why disturb the peace and interfere? If we say that binding must be eradicated because foreigners ridicule us for doing this, it must be admitted that they ridicule us for other reasons as well. So foot binding allowed the Chinese, followed the Chinese as they uh, traveled the world. There was a Chinese woman making a living on the streets of Paris in the middle of the 1930s, charging people to look at her unbound bound feet. And Howard Levy, who's the author of uh, the, the most interesting study of this, uh, of this practice, says, overseas Chinese in Paris became indignant and protested to the Chinese consulate that her behavior was an affront to national honor. The Japanese scholar Goto Asaro, writing in 18, 1939, summarized the situation succinctly. The campaign against foot binding, he said, had been aimed at saving China's national face. So let me give a third, even shorter sketch of a great moral revolution. Consider the rising opposition of the British working class to slavery in the mid-19th century. By the time of the American Civil War, British commercial interests were largely allied with the American South, whose plantations provided cotton for the mills of the north of England, which were one of the generators of the growth of British uh, capital and capitalism. If elite opinion in Parliament had prevailed, Britain would probably have supported the South in the Civil War. Had they done so, it's not clear that Abraham Lincoln would have won, and the end of slavery in the United States would have been a much more long drawn out affair. So it's an important question why they didn't. And the reason they didn't support the South is that there was, by the mid-19th century, a significant body of working class opinion that joined with the opposition of middle class evangelicals to oppose slavery. British parliaments by the mid-century 
had a much more extensive franchise than they had in 1806 when the slave trade was outlawed, and they had to listen for the first time to a self-conscious working class. So what motivated the working men of England, it was mostly working men's associations, uh, against slavery? Well, many things, no doubt, but one of them was their growing sense of the dignity of labor. Slavery in the United States and the West Indies involves the symbolic identification of labor with a, dishonest, a dishonored class of dark-skinned people. If you have pride in your identity as a working man, if you have a sense of the honor of working people, that's incompatible with accepting that labor means dishonor. So a concern for their own honor turned them against slavery. They were defending their honor, not the dignity of the slave. OK, those are my three stories. They're interesting, I hope. Uh, but you might say, what have they got to do with us? And anyway, haven't we learned better? Honor was mobilized in these cases in a good cause. Honor turned, the revision of honor ended dueling. The concern for national honor ended uh, foot binding. And the rising uh, concern for the honor of working people uh, turned Britain uh, against slavery and thus arguably uh, uh, de helped determine the outcome of the Civil War, which was the most important event in the history of Atlantic slavery. Um, but of course, uh, you could have been in favor of all of these changes without honor, without taking any notice of honor. And one reason that honor went out of fashion as the subject of serious analysis was the democratic idea that honor requires undemocratic hierarchies. It died, that is the study of honor, died like the duel with the aristocratic honor uh, uh, the, the practices of aristocratic honor. And in fact, honor has anyway been subjected always to skeptical scrutiny in Christian culture, because to care for your honor seems too close to cultivating an unchristian vanity. In response to skepticism of this Christian kind about um, honor, the Scottish Enlightenment philosopher David Hume was adamant that, quote, a desire of fame, reputation, or a character with others is so far from being blameworthy that it seems inseparable from virtue, genius, capacity, and a generous disposition. Generous in the 18th century in English means honorable or noble, not, yet not what we mean by it. Hume's point here is that it's hard to sustain virtue without the support of uh, honor. And I think he's right. There are a few human beings who care little about how other people think of them. There are sociopaths who don't care when you catch them lying. And there are also occasionally uh, unself-regarding saintly people. But by and large, we humans respond to respect and contempt, not because we have instrumental reasons to do so, but because we can't help it. As John Locke put it concisely, contempt or want of due respect discovered either in looks, words, or gesture from whomsoever it comes brings always uneasiness with it for nobody can contentedly bear being slighted. The first reason that we shouldn't do without honor is that we can't. And if it's right, then the serious question about honor isn't whether we mobilize it uh, in the service of moral or other kinds of virtue, but how and when. So let's return to honor as it was conceived among the British upper classes in the early 19th century and get clear about exactly what was wrong with its codes. That system of honor depended, like all systems of esteem, of, of uh, positive respect, on the assumption of a standard against which people could be assessed. It was a standard that required certain forms of behavior, duty to king and country, courtesy to ladies, and so on, on the part of gentlemen. But the standard had regard to mere facts of birth as well as norms of behavior. You got points simply by showing up from the right womb. The struggle to break this tight connection between honor and birth is nearly as old as that connection. Remember Horace, uh, who, as you probably don't know, was the son of a freed slave, Horace, the great Roman poet, addressing Mycenas, the richest and noblest of the private patrons of the arts in the reign of Augustus Caesar. Mycenas, according to Horace, says that it's no matter who your parents are so long as you are worthy, dignus. But Horace complains that most Romans don't agree. Anyone who offers himself for public office, the poet grumbles, 
gets asked, quote, from what father he may be descended, and whether he is base because of the obscurity of his mother. Now, this is the feature of the old system of honor that we have, of course, rightly rejected, as we are uh, inclined to reject the moral salience of other uh, ascriptive identities, not just class, but other ones. In meritocratic societies, however, social status can reflect not arbitrary matters, but reasonable standards of evaluation. What is wrong in honoring a Nobel laureate? Surely an economy of esteem organized around codes that are defensible can support motives that we should want to support. And since the psychological mechanisms that underlie esteem will operate whether we wish them to or not, organizing them to the extent that we can to align with ends we can endorse is the only sensible policy. Honor isn't morality, as I've insisted, though Aristotle was wrong, and it runs against morality sometimes. But the psychology that the law of honor mobilizes can unquestionably be put, as we saw in my case studies, in the service of the right and the good. Now, to say that is not to suggest that we have easy control over the habits of feeling that sustain the practices of honor. We can't choose whether we feel pained by the disrespect or elated by the respect of others. We don't choose which codes we find compelling. We don't decide to respond with respect to virtue and contempt to vice. These reactive attitudes, as philosophers call them, are part of our normative natures. But we can choose to create social practices that take these inevitable responses and point them in the right direction. When we see shame's power, we can choose to mobilize it, in the simplest case, by publishing the names of offenders. And likewise, once we reflect that respect motivates, we can publish the names and, more importantly, celebrate the lives of the worthy. As we learn more about developmental psychology, no doubt we'll find other ways to shape and channel honor and its effects. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights starts in the first sentence of its preamble by insisting, quote, that recognition of the inherent dignity of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. UN declarations often say things like that. <laughs> to most thinkers about the democratic revolutions, the idea of the inherent dignity of each person, I'm oh, sorry, to most thinkers before the democratic revolutions, before the French and the American revolutions, the idea of the inherent dignity of each person would have seemed absurd. They would have said it's obvious that dignity is something that only dignified people have, and they would have given you a list of people who had dignity. So whatever dignity is today in our more democratic times, it has to be something other than it was in the past. Dignus, that, that word that Horace uses, which is the Roman ancestor of our word dignity, dignus is, dignitas is, is what senators have. I don't mean our senators, but I mean their senators. Um, our senators may have it too. Uh, and so, by definition, it's something that non-senators or members, people, people are not members of the senatorial class, don't have. The close connection between honor and dignity suggests a place to look in thinking about what has happened to dignity, namely, by looking at the connection between dignity and respect. Now, the philosopher Stephen Darwell has made an important distinction between two kinds of respect, what he calls recognition respect and appraisal respect. Appraisal respect involves judging a person pos positively according to some standard. So this is the kind of respect we have for Rafael Nadal as a tennis player or Meryl Streep as an actress. And uh, sometimes you might call it esteem. But there's another kind of respect, which we call recognition respect, that involves, and I could only begin by putting this rather abstractly, what it involves is treating people in ways that give appropriate weight to some relevant fact about them. So when we respect powerful people, when I respect a judge in court or a police officer, when I'm out driving, I treat them warily because they have the capacity to compel me to do things. So my respect recognizes the fact of their power. But you can also respect a sensitive person by speaking gently or a disabled person by assisting her when she asks for help. So respecting people in this sense doesn't require you to rate them especially highly it requires you to notice some relevant fact about them and to respond to it appropriately. Because there are so many kinds of facts about people that we can recognize and respond to, recognition respect for people can have a great variety of emotional tones and can come along with attitudes both 
positive and negative. When the Roman emperor Caligula said, Odorint do metuant, let them hate so long as they fear, he was expressing his delight in getting one sort of respect, but it was hardly the sort of positive respect that goes with honor. As a result, the sort of recognition respect that's important for honor involves more than just giving appropriate to weights, uh, to some weight to some fact about a person. It requires a positive attitude of a certain sort, uh, the, roughly the positive attitude that we have when we esteem people highly, when we have the other kind of respect for them. So one way to understand what's happened to the word dignity is to say that it's come to refer to a right to respect that people have simply in virtue of their humanity, independently, that is, of gender or social status or ethnicity. So here are a few of the facts about people that we give proper weight to in acknowledging human dignity, that human beings have the capacity for creating lives of significance, that we can suffer, love, create, that we need food, shelter, and recognition by others. And these facts, which we might call the grounds of dignity, make it appropriate to respond to people in ways that respect such fundamental human needs and capacities. For many people in the Abrahamic religions, one of the grounds of our dignity is that we are all created in God's image. So much of the time, I've been discussing the forms of respect, which I've called esteem, that come from positive appraisal. Dignity, in this modern sense, has become a right to recognition respect, where we give appropriate weight to crucial moral facts about people. Now, some people think only hierarchical forms of the right to respect should be called honor. And there's a reason for this, because many of the most noticeable forms of honor, from the Iliad on, are indeed hierarchical. What Achilles wants is something that other people can't have if he's to have it. Uh, Achilles wants a certain kind of honor, but it's a competitive kind of honor. He has to have more of something than other people. We can't, 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 we can't all have the same degree of it. Now, I don't think, but the issue here isn't just a terminological one. I think much is gained by thinking about both the hierarchical and the non-hierarchical codes that assign respect together. So what's democratic about our current culture is that we now presuppose that all normal human beings, not just those who are specially elevated, are entitled to respect. But granting everyone recognition respect is perfectly consistent with granting greater appraisal respect to some people uh, than to others, because these are different forms of respect. So now we can say, honoring some people especially, like Rafael Nadal, is consistent with recognizing the dignity of everyone else. Such dignity doesn't require the comparative forms of appraisal that go with the competitive forms of honor. It's not something you earn. And the appropriate response to your dignity is not pride, but self-respect. After all, if your humanity entitles you to respect from others, then surely it entitles you to respect from yourself. So the role of esteem in shaping behavior depends on our own commitment to the standards by which we're evaluated. My behavior is responsive to your esteem because in esteeming me uh, for some achievement, uh, you're assessing me against a standard that I believe in. Rafael Nadal believes in being good at tennis. That's why our respect for his capacity at tennis matters to him. So as a result, the power of honor derives from the fact that the standard by which I'm found wanting when I fail uh, when I'm regarded with contempt, is my standard, too, not just the standard of the onlooker. In understanding collective honor, the honor of classes and nations, the sort of thing that mobilized the English working classes against slavery or that mobilized the Chinese literati against footbinding, this point is crucial. It explains why the moral arguments that I insisted were present in each case before the moral revolution, while they didn't do the work, they were not irrelevant. Because honor requires a standard by which you can be appraised. And sometimes the standard is moral. So Kang Yu Wei, my favorite anti-footbinding campaigner, worried about Chinese honor because he believed in the system of values by which his country was being judged. He wouldn't have cared so much about the negative view of foreigners of Chinese footbinding if he didn't think it was wrong himself. He worried about the contempt of the West because he thought like Westerners, that in binding the feet of their daughters, his people were doing something 
that was pointlessly cruel. He wasn't worried simply about the consequences for China and the Chinese of having a poor reputation. He was seeing himself through the eyes of others and not liking what he saw. The claim to honor requires us, in the fine phrase of the Scottish poet Robbie Burns, to see ourselves as others see us, or as he would have said, see ourselves as others see us. <laughs> Knowing as we do that our own opinion of ourselves is too likely to be a self-delusion. So we care about respect. Respect reflects judgments about how well we're doing by standards we believe in ourselves. It's a fact, too, that people respond to us not just as individuals, but also as members of groups, as bearers of social identities. And those responses include respecting us, granting us respect if we belong to a respectable social group, and denying us respect if we belong to a disreputable group. Now, I don't think we should just take this as a brute fact. Even if we can't help our responses, it matters whether we can give them a rational foundation. But I think we can defend some of these attitudes by making the following elementary observation. Many of the groups to which we belong do things collectively. Sometimes, for example, it makes sense to say that the nation acts. When the United States imposes a trade embargo, or sends humanitarian aid, or supports a resolution in the Security Council, this is something that Americans do, not individually, but together. That is, the act is done in your name, but it's, uh, it's our act in deeper ways than that. Because the individuals who act in our name, our ambassadors and so on, and our generals and our soldiers, are shaped by a culture that we have created together. And they're acting under the authority of a Congress and a president that we elected. They're responding to values transmitted and sustained by an American civil society that's made up of Americans. And when it makes sense to speak of American aims and the picture of the world that guides the pursuit of them, it makes sense to speak of America's acts as something that Americans do together. Well, in a recent novel, um, The Diary of a Bad Year, by the Nobel Literature Laureate John Katsir, uh, the South African protagonist writes of his response to the evidence in the New Yorker magazine that the US administration has sanctioned torture and subverted conventions proscribing it. And he says this, if we grant the truth of what the New Yorker claims, then the issue for individual Americans becomes a moral one. How, in the face of this shame to which I am subjected, do I behave? How do I save my honor? So here's a reminder of why the sentiment of national honor might be worth preserving. Like individual honor, it can motivate us together to see if we can do together what is right. The issue of torture is moral, of course, but what engages each patriotic American is not just morality, but also American honor. And Kinsia rightly underlines the fact that we may have as little choice in this as we do in caring for our individual esteem. That is, if you identify as an American, you can't but feel shame when your country behaves badly, and you can't but feel pride when it behaves well. But he says it like this. He's a novelist. He says it more beautifully than that. A few days ago, I heard a performance of the Sibelius Fifth Symphony. As the closing bars approached, I experienced exactly the large, swelling emotion that the music was written to elicit. What would it have been like, I wondered, to be a Finn in the audience at the first performance of the symphony in Helsinki nearly a century ago and feel that swell overtake one? The answer, one would have felt proud. Proud that one of us could put together such sounds. Proud that out of nothing, we human beings can make such stuff. Contrast that with the feelings of shame that we, our people, have made Guantanamo. Musical creation on the one hand, a machine for inflicting pain and humiliation on the other, the best and the worst that human beings are capable of. Now, I'm aware, of course, that honor is still being mobilized to do harm. In many places in our world, a woman can be killed by men of her own family because she has sex outside marriage. So honor can be mobilized in the service, not just of bad things, but of evil. And I want, in closing, to explain why I don't believe that even this horrendous case should urge us to abandon honor. So in many countries, both Christian and Muslim in the past, the codes of honor required the death of a sexually dishonored woman at the hands of her family. 
even though the mainstream religious traditions of both Christianity and Islam condemn these killings. Remember dueling. In some societies, indeed, even today, a woman loses her honor and earns a murderous penalty, even if she was raped. Aspects of the code that govern these so-called honor killings are, of course, recognizable to most people around the world, even in the industrialized West. Here, for example, it's taken an enormous amount of work to persuade women and men that rape shouldn't be treated as a source of shame for the victim. It's not, of course, that women who have been raped believe deep down that they were asking for it or that it was their fault. They know that that isn't true. The shame that many victims of sexual assault feel has to do instead with the powerlessness of being a victim. It's not guilt. It's not the thought that they've done something wrong that haunts them. It's the reminder of their humiliation. And that humiliation makes it likely that she will lose the respect of those who know she was raped. Indeed, it may undermine her respect for herself. The assumption that because a person cannot resist the physical imposition of another, she or he has been shown to be inferior in some general way is very widespread and not just in connection with sexual assault. Within the system of attitudes and feelings that you see here is the trace of the idea that women who have been raped like men who have been defeated in an assault, have lost their honor. Weakness is a source of shame. But whatever our thoughts and feelings about, say, premarital sex, most of us in this country, like most people in Austria or Ghana, cannot make sense of someone who thinks the right response to an unmarried daughter who chooses to have sex is to kill her, let alone of someone who kills a daughter or sister who's been raped. And yet, according to an estimate in a UN report in 2000, quote, perhaps as many as 5,000 women and girls a year are murdered by members of their own families for this sort of reason. According to an advisor of the Prime Minister of Pakistan, in 2003, as many as 1,261 women were murdered in Pakistan in this way. And there's widespread agreement that official figures undercount the problem. And of course, for every woman that is killed, there must be many thousands who are terrified into conforming to the codes by the realistic threat of murder. So I've argued that we must keep a place for honor, but that it needs careful management. The honor that sustains honor killing requires, of course, at the very least, a revision of the codes. And one strategy to achieve this would be to attempt to dismantle this kind of honor altogether. After all, the whole system is aimed at the subordination of women by men. Shouldn't we just try to work out how to achieve its abolition? Well, my three very different case studies suggest a different approach. They show how changes in honor codes can reshape honor, mobilizing it in the service of the good. With the duel, the revisions in notions of gentlemanly honor in Britain in the mid-century produced a new culture in which the central threat to gentlemanly honor, the possibility of loss of respect and shame, turned from being a reason to duel to being a reason not to duel. Solvunto risu tabulae. The case is dismissed with laughter. In China, at the turn of the last century, the honor of women of the Chinese cultural elite required them to bind their feet. Yet changes in the perception of the nation's honor among the literati led to the mobilization of one kind of honor, national honor, against the old system of aristocratic honor whose codes demanded foot binding. Intellectuals who wanted their country to find its place in the modern world reshaped the culture of honor so that in a generation, bound feet came to be a source not of honor, but of embarrassment, even of shame. In the late 19th century, a family of the Han Chinese elite would have had great difficulty finding a suitable husband for a girl with natural feet. By the 1930s, the opposite was true. And in finding their own honor as working people, the English working classes in the mid 19th century allied themselves against the culture of slavery, which associated freedom and whiteness with honor, and slavery and blackness with dishonor. The lesson I draw is that it may be better to reshape honor towards the emancipation of women, rendering, reordering honor codes like the ones that sustain honor murder in Pakistan, or that lead to murders and suicides of girls among the Kurds of Turkey. Better, that is, than simply raising the standard of morality or of human rights against it. For, as I pointed out, religion and morality, and often the law, were already against the evils of dueling, foot binding, and slavery, and that didn't do it. 
It was changes within the code of honor that brought these evils to an end. And I think we can hope that similar changes can achieve the same ends in the case of honor killing. Because already women in Pakistan ask the right question. How can a man claim to be honorable when he kills a woman of his own family? Already modernizing intellectuals ask the question about honor killing that Kang Yu Wei asked about footbinding. How can we be respected in the world if we do this terrible thing? And they ask this question not just because their honor world has expanded to include the rest of humanity, but also because they want their nation to be worthy in their own eyes of respect. So these are the places I believe we must push against the murderous side of honor, not by insisting on what everyone already knows, that Islam is against it, or that it involves a moral offense against the human rights of its victims. These things are true, but they won't do it by themselves. We must turn honor against honor killing as it was turned against dueling, against footbinding, and against slavery. I think we need honor if we're to end honor killing. So far from being part of the case for abandoning honor, honor killing is actually central to the case for retaining it. Thanks very much. Doesn't it? Yes. Honors is what I do. sure whether you're familiar with Donald Keegan's book about causes of war, but in it he poses uh, honor as the, I believe, uh, Peloponnesian War, Second Punic War, World War I, World War II, I think Civil War, and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, and if I think about it in the same categories, I can throw in Iraq and Afghanistan into the whole mix as well. Uh, so uh, is that something you touched on in your book, or uh, what do you think about his thesis altogether? Um, well, uh, so yes, I do think about it in the book, and I talk about why I think that, um, m roughly, my view is uh, we need military honor for soldiers, but uh, we shouldn't uh, allow military honor to uh, generate foreign policy. So we need, and the point about honor is that it allows for different kinds of people to be governed by different kinds of codes. And uh, it seems to me that the honor codes that, that are useful in soldiers, especially soldiers in battle, uh, for reasons that I could go into if you like, um, are not useful for foreign ministers uh, and presidents and prime ministers. And that's fine, because what 
uh, what the norms, what the codes are that should govern you depends on who you are and what you're doing. Uh, so uh, now, we have examples, of course, of um, successful military uh, leaders who became political leaders, and often they manage this better than civilians. That is, often they grasp better than civilians that different standards uh, of response are appropriate to, uh, to challenges on the battlefield and in the world of, um, uh, in the world of diplomacy and, and conflict of that sort. But yes, I mean, uh, the, the, the association of honor with violence is one of the, not just gender violence, but warfare, uh, I is one of the challenges for sustaining honor. Is can we, uh, but notice what happened in the case of dueling. Um, uh, from um, between about 1830 and 1850, it changed from being the case that a man could acquire honor by dueling to it's being the case that a man became ridiculous by challenging someone to a duel. So uh, we can, uh, now, the very class, that, that, that is English gentlemen, that uh, who went through this reform, that stuck and dueling ceased and it's still ridiculous and it was ridiculous throughout the 20th century for an English gentleman to challenge another English gentleman to a duel. Um, but if you're thinking about the First World War, uh, which occurs you know, within 60 years of the, of roughly speaking, of the end of dueling, it is true that many of the motivations that led to the absurdities of the First World War had to do precisely with a kind of pathological form or a destructive form of honor. So even though they had lost the role of um, private violence, that is the duel, in sustaining honor, British, the, the British uh, elite still uh, was mobilized by honor uh, to do things that were in the case of the First World War. I mean, can anybody remember what the First World War was about? Right, well, uh, it, was, it was not just the British no, no. elite, but it was the elites of, you yes. know, the Austrians took it upon themselves to be dishonored by the assassination of Archduke yes. by some second-rate yes. guy. Yes, right. So, and, and what you have is this, so th th it's a slow process, <laughs> uh, and uh, learning when it is and isn't appropriate to uh, be mobilized by honor is, is a hard thing. I mean, I have, uh, so I've, I've focused on uh, the case of honor killing because I think it's the, the big, the, the sort of elephant in the room uh, if you're going to talk about honor. Um, but, um, but in the book I talk about uh, warfare and, uh, as well. And I also talk about professional ethics and the role of honor in sustaining professional standards, uh, which I think is something uh, um, I mean, I thought this before two years ago, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's very evident, I think, that um, you can't, um, th there are roughly speaking three main systems for the regulation of behavior. There's the law, which, which, which offers penalties for misbehavior. There's the economy, which offers rewards and losses for behavior. And there's what uh, uh, Philip uh, Pettit and jo Jeffrey Brennan call the economy of esteem, which has to do with the circulation of, of honor and so on. Um, you can't regulate professional conduct successfully, usually, by uh, just two of those. You need all three. Um, you can't make doctors behave properly simply by having laws that punish bad behavior by doctors. What really regulates the behavior of doctors is, is the respect of other doctors. It's a system of esteem. And, and, and the culture of, of, of the medical world is a very important resource in trying to regulate um, certain forms of, of behavior. And one of the reasons why it's so hard for the law to do it is because um, the law requires us to take regular citizens, jurors, and assess whether what someone has done conforms to a set of standards. But figuring out whether what a doctor has done conforms to a set of standards involves medical knowledge. And jurors don't have medical knowledge, right, uh, generally speaking. Uh, in fact, if you were a doctor in a malpractice case, you, they wouldn't put you on the jury. <laughs> they would make sure you weren't on the jury. So, uh, and the same thing is true in general about professional norms. 
um, congressmen are not good at telling whether uh, professors are doing their job, uh, whether they're state legislatures or national legislature. They don't know how to tell. Uh, if we want to get uh, academics to behave properly, one of the things we have to do is to enforce through our systems of respect and esteem and, and contempt and, and so on, um, uh, enforce norms of behavior that we believe in, we, we scholars. And so I think um, uh, we need honor not by itself. We need honor, we need the law, we need the economy, we need all these ways of, of regulating behavior, but we, uh, and, and, um, and, and we need them in the professions. I had a, I've always had a lot of thought about the role of women and men, and I think that men have more identity hunger than women do. The mythology by which we live, it's harder for men to be somebody. So they often will do violent things or anything to get a role where what women do to become, have an identity is much more gentle. Well, I, I think that that, um, though, I mean, first of all, uh, um, there are widespread cultural <laughs> variations in these matters. And I say that not just abstractly, but because I grew up half of my life, my young life, in Ghana. And um, I wouldn't say that the women of my hometown um, are as gentle as all that. <laughs> um, the last Asante war against the British, I, the kingdom that I grew up in was called Asante, uh, where the lead general was a woman. And if she hadn't insisted on fighting the war, the men probably wouldn't have fought it. So there are, there are big cultural variations. But that's because I think, uh, to put it, uh, to connect it with my, my theme, uh, the, the codes of honor are almost always gendered. That is, the way you get honor depends on your gender as well as on what you do. And so uh, we require different things. Uh, uh, there are few recorded instances of women dueling uh, in England and France. But um, when, they, when they did, uh, first of all, it was always the Duchesse to somewhere and the Vicomtesse to somewhere else. They were always very, very elite women. Uh, that was how they knew how to use swords at all. And second, it was thought to be slightly absurd or ridiculous at a time when it was not thought to be absurd or ridiculous for men to be doing it. So the, the codes differ uh, for men and women. And um, it's true that um, in almost all societies, uh, it's easier for men to get honor by doing violent things than for women. So there's no, the honor system, the, the economy of esteem, mostly doesn't reward violence on the part of women, and mostly does <laughs> reward violence on the part of men, though, as I pointed out, in the case of the codes of, of, the, of the British aristocracy in the 19th century, um, restraining violence in your private life came to be one of the dominant ways for men to acquire honor. And um, I mean, this was still a very much a class society, and so for gentlemen to acquire honor. And, um, and that was a big shift. And when, when Colonel Newman, in the passage I quoted, says, uh, that it's a definition of a gentleman that you don't cause harm. Um, that they took that seriously, uh, and they had sort of contempt for men who couldn't regulate their anger. Uh, gentlemen who couldn't regulate their anger and who struck out at uh, other men. That was regarded as dishonorable. Um, so, um, so yes, I mean, there's a d almost. It's very hard to think of uh, codes honor codes that don't treat men and women differently. <laughs> well, so, so, I mean, there are um, certain, there are codes, uh, th there are standards from, uh, from which are associated with economies of esteem that are not particularly gendered. Uh, the way you get to be um, a successful um, uh, novelist 
um, uh, is it, it doesn't I mean is no longer as gendered as it was and, and is arguably uh, not gendered at all and it wasn't I mean while there were expectations around gender in association with the novel um, you know a lot of people didn't know that George Eliot was a woman <laughs> uh, when she wrote her novels and um, and they nevertheless were successful. So I th there are examples of standards which don't have, I don't mean there are none, uh, but, but, it, but many of the sort of standards um, against which people are assessed for esteem are gendered. And I think that's one of the mechanisms by which um, differences in masculine and feminine behavior are produced in societies is, is in fact through the economy of esteem, the rewards for certain kinds of behavior are just very different uh, depending on what your gender is, or what your sex is, I should say. Can we repeat what our version of gender is? Kanye. <laughs> do, do, do we need hair to be a hero in our culture? Uh, I you mean in this culture? I, I, uh, you would know, um, I'm not trying to be a hero, so, <laughs> so my loss of hair doesn't worry me. Michael Jordan. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to figure out how to ask this question. If you, if you think that there are a lot of different um, concepts and um, ways to deploy um, emotions that contextualize and situize, uh, situate human beings socially um, and that they extend from very personal kind of uh, subjective feelings through national, international, all kinds of um, other registers like this. What I'm trying to figure out is why you are um, picking one of these, honor, and uh, investigating it, and what the value of that strategy is as opposed to, say, looking um, maybe uh, at a certain historical juncture and then look at all of the different registers of um, these kinds of things that you know, position people uh, a certain way within their societies? Well, I've, I've really two reasons. One is I, was, I started this work because I was genuinely puzzled by what I read in the literature about foot binding, about how the Chinese literati were moved to act against it. And so when I started on this, that was the case that interested me. And I was just trying to figure it out. And, um, and I started writing a book about honor because the, it struck me as very surprising what the answer was. <laughs> the answer was that honor played an absolutely central role in the ending of a practice for which there were many, I would have thought, abstractly speaking, better reasons to stop it. And, and then I started thinking whether that might be true in other cases. And it seems to me that it turns out that it is. Now, if you want to answer the question uh, in great detail, how, honor, how um, foot binding came to an end, you will, of course, have to mention many other things than honor. And so uh, if, you're focusing, if you're focusing on a case, then honor will only be one of the components. I focused on honor's role in, in the end of slavery by looking at the response of one class in one country to the challenge of thinking about slavery. I think it was, I, I argued that it was an important contribution to what happened because of its, the, the role of these political issues in determining the response of Britain in the Civil War, which I think would have made a difference uh, if it had gone the other way. Um, but, uh, but again, the, the, these, these working men's associations were thinking about many things. If you were to follow the life of these working men's associations, their <coughs> thoughts about um, slavery and anti-slavery were a pretty small part of what they thought about. They thought about many other things all of the time. So, um, so I thought, I think it's interesting thing. I don't think it's the only interesting thing. I do think it's neglected, uh, particularly by philosophers. I mean, philosophers, uh, Aristotle wrote a lot about honor, uh, and up to, um, say, Adam Smith, people wrote a lot about honor, and Nietzsche writes about honor. But on the whole, in the last hundred and something years, in neither in English nor in German nor in French, have we had a great deal of attention paid to honor. So I, I think it's interesting in part because it's a neglected topic, and also because once you pointed out to people, even though the language of honor may seem old-fashioned, or perhaps even to some people irrelevant, if you think about what the structure of honor is, the structure of honor is a set of codes that confer upon people entitlements to respect 
on the basis of uh, behavior that is um, um, where the codes are dependent upon your identity, your gender, your, your class, your nationality, your religion, and so on. Uh, that structure is extremely widespread in the modern world, even if we don't call it honor. And dignity turns out to be an instance of that, turns out to fit that general pattern. And dignity is kind of important, even if we don't talk about honor, we do talk about dignity now. So um, in Experiments in Ethics, in, in, the, in the book that was mentioned earlier, I do talk a lot more about many, many different psychological uh, phenomena that has to do with, uh, that, that help shape moral behavior. But this one, I didn't mention that book because I hadn't thought about this stuff at that point, and it didn't come up because it isn't in the literature. So people don't talk about it very much. Um, so the main reason for writing this book uh, and thinking about this was just that it seemed to be a neglected dimension of the social psychology of um, uh, moral change. Uh, not that it's the only thing that matters or, or that you could ever bring about moral change by honor all, as it were, all alone. And at the end, I tried to, to suggest that um, the, the moral arguments and the law, they're not irrelevant. It's just that they aren't enough. And once you reshape the honor code, then uh, one of the things that the honor code can do is channel the moral, the moral thoughts. We're going to have one more last question, just because this gentleman has been very patient. So let me just hand off the mic for one more. Thank you, thank you so much. This is such a fun <laughs> talk. It is so rare to hear about honor. Uh, and um, I come away from this talk feeling a little sad about honor because it does seem that honor is actually a force that is oftentimes creating all kinds of mischief in our society. And well, so my question is three categories. Um, it seems to me honor is somewhere in between. Uh, humility, pride, and honor is somewhere in between. Is it possible to live a life of humility that is a life of honor, or does honor by definition do away with, because it's, it's aggressive, whereas pride, you know, there's pride there. So I mean, that's sort of my, well, is that, um, a, is that a, a real formation of the thought? The, the, it's a good question. The, um, I do talk, uh, you have to talk about pride a good deal if you write a book about honor because um, because one of the interesting features of honor codes is that they differ enormously in what they say about pride. So remember, the English, for, the, for the English gentleman, um, uh, uh, self-respect is important, but, but pride, and particularly, as it were, claiming esteem, actually undermines your honor. Uh, so, and this has to do with various things, including um, the fact that uh, as I said, Christian culture is very worried about vanity and distinguishing between vanity, which is the vice, and um, the forms of pride that are morally permissible is a great challenge for Christian moral theory. Uh, so pride is a big problem uh, for um, honor. Uh, and particularly, I think, uh, learning to distinguish between appropriate self-respect and a kind of vaunting pride or, uh, uh, and, and what's a appropriate um, desire for, I mean, there's a big tension at the heart of honor, right, and it's this. Um, the honorable person cares about sticking to the standard, but he also cares about being regarded as someone who sticks to the standard. And one of the standards can be that you shouldn't care about what other people think. Right? So there's, there's a kind of psychological paradox at the heart of certain kinds of honor, uh, which you see very strikingly, I think. Um, the, the, the first chapter of my book uh, discusses in great detail uh, one duel. Uh, it was a very important duel because it was arguably the last non-ridiculous duel <laughs> in England. Uh, and it involved a man who was against dueling and who was, at the time, not only Prime Minister of England, but probably the most famous Englishman of the 19th century, namely the Duke of Wellington. And he knew it was wrong. And he was, by the way, a very serious Christian. Uh, uh, high church, not evangelical, but still he was a very serious Anglican. Uh, 
So he, he knew it was illegal. He was the prime minister. He was the prime minister breaking the law. Uh, he knew the church was against him. He knew that the person with whom he was dueling, who was a, an idiot, uh, whose name was splendidly the Earl of Wintersea and Nottingham, um, uh, he knew that the, the accusation that that man had made against him was going to be believed by nobody and was preposterous. So he could have ignored it. And the interesting question is why someone who, upright man, public servant, prime minister, kind of visible, uh, did this thing that was illegal uh, in order to sort of, you know, deal with his, uh, but in the heart of this, in, if you read his, uh, the notes he wrote to his seconds and to, and to Win Winchelsea, um, in the heart of it there is this interesting back and forth about whether this is about whether I'm a good person or whether it's ab about I'm being, I'm recognized to be. Uh, so honor has this funny paradox in it about what's the proper balance between simply living up to the standard on the one hand and being concerned about being regarded as living up to the standards uh, and respected for living up to the standards. And you can very quickly bet, get lose honor if you seem too preoccupied with how you look. Uh, and so it, it, it has a kind of paradox at the heart of it. And, that, and in that paradox, pride is the name for one of the psychological <laughs> problems. And so it's, 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 a, it's a genuine difficulty. Uh, I don't think one can resolve it exactly. Um, it's, it's that this paradox is kind of there in the heart of honor. Thank you all.